Okay. Um, as I said, uh, my name is Mary Sock, and I am a um, social studies teacher at Watchung Hills Regional High School. Um, I am also the diversity club advisor for my school. Um, and I also sit on the diversity council at Kane University, which is an educator network that unites teachers uh, across the state of New Jersey. And I teach two graduate classes from Kane University. One is teaching a cohort of teachers on teaching the Holocaust, and the other one is on prejudice reduction. Okay. Um, we have here a quote, I'm sure some of you have used this before, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that it ever has. Um, I think most of you are familiar with uh, the Not In Our Town as an organization. Yes? Somebody answer me. Yes, do we know what Not In Our Schools does and Not In Our Town? Let me pull you up. Yes? Yes, yes. Okay, all right, good. All right, so back here, and then uh, I wanna see, I'll look at some faces, okay? Um, so we know here over the past few years that it has been very, very challenging for teachers. Um, and I wanna thank you for your commitment and dedication to your students, right? And as some of you are starting the school year, you know, you're thinking about why should I start a Not In Our School campaign? Right, and I want to give the pitch for a couple reasons that you should do that. And the first thing I'd like you to do, and um, I'll stop the screen share so we can have a little discussion, is I want you to think about a time like when you were in school um, and think about a lesson or an activity that you felt personally connected to, like something that had meaning to you, something that still resonates with you. Um, you know, how did you engage with the material? What was it? that allowed you to have a personal connection. And if you could just unmute yourself, it's totally fine. You don't need to raise your hand or anything like that. All right, I'm, I'm gonna, um, just going to throw this out there. I mean, I don't know if you're talking about a, a lesson that engaged us when we were it in school. It could be a lesson. It could be some activity that you did in high school, like something that you remember that still has some kind of meaning to you and why it did it have um, meaning? When, when I was in junior high school, I had a really cool teacher, Dudley Butts. And Dudley, he used to do a, um, we did a Greek, we were studying Greece and we did a Greek festival every year, a, you know, a food festival. And we dressed in togos and we sat on the floor and ate grapes and chicken. And it was, oh, I just remember it being fun, interactive. He always made class so interesting and fun. So that, that comes to my mind. Excellent. Thank you so much. Anybody else? I saw a family tree assignment. What else? Oh, come on, you have to remember something from elementary school and high school. It couldn't have been all that bad, yes? Go ahead, Patrice. Now you have to unmute yourself, well, guys. Okay, I know this sounds obvious since I'm a filmmaker, but I remember being a sophomore in high school and, um, and seeing the film Night and Fog. It, my teacher brought it to our classroom and, and we lived in a, we lived, I grew up near Ferguson, our community, we, we didn't have a lot of films when I was growing up. It wasn't a typical thing to do, but that film, I think really changed my life, right? And, and my way of thinking it was, you know, I think it was much more required um, or it was the burgeoning sort of uh, opening of studying the Holocaust, but uh, that film really, uh, and the discussion that happened after was was really life changing for me. Thank you, Patrice. Anybody else? I'll share. Thanks, Teresa. So when I think it was when I was in seventh grade, there was a presidential election. This is in the eighties, so it was Reagan. And in my particular town, most parents were supporting Reagan, but I was not. 
And so we did a, a mock election in the classroom, but we also got to like, we did one, we did one election and then kids got to advocate for different candidates. And like, I ended up changing a couple of the kids' votes <laughs> by the end of the class. And, um, and that was really fun for me because it, it sort of made me, you know, I already liked politics, but it, it got me into the idea of like, oh, I could really change and influence things, even though I was only a seventh grader. Excellent. Is it okay if I jump in? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. So for me, it was actually a social studies class um, in high school. And it really didn't click with me. I, I loved the class, um, I loved the teacher, um, engaging students. And it was around reading multiple sources of news and getting different perspectives. And I think in this day and age now, that really plays... Um, an important role in things. So when you said that, that was the first thing that came to my mind. So thanks for bringing that memory back Excellent. up. Excellent, thank you. Don't be shy. Yeah, thinking of, you know, as a social studies teacher, but I think back to when I was in class, um, I had an, an amazing teacher uh, who in my junior year, who that was like one of the reasons I became a teacher. But I remember specifically learning about Emmett Till um, as part of the, the civil rights movement. Um, and just being a young person and just, you know, connecting with what happened and studying the civil rights movement, um, something that I hadn't really learned about beforehand. And um, the community that I lived in, in Northern New Jersey was a, a red line community. So we had a black population. I mean, it had changed since then, but uh, I tell my own students like that I went, I lived in a community where this happened and I never had a conversation about it in high school. You know, I, I didn't really even learn what redlining was until college. And I was like, oh, wait a second, that like describes my community. You know what I, and I and I tell my students that because I want them like I want to have these conversations that they feel equipped when they go on to college and so on, um, you know, to be aware and to be knowledgeable. Anybody else? We're good. All right. Let's move on here. Okay. So um, here is you know what studies show and so on is if if we give students the opportunity right, to participate in real world opportunities, right, things that they are able to create themselves, right, and we give them power, we give them ownership. You can see this picture here um, is that our students had started what was called a white up, a white out, which was an anti-bullying event that we had actually seen on the Not In Our Town website that we had done for a number of years. We actually have our you know, local state senator there as well. Um, but after the first year that we did it, the kids picked up on it, right? And we have had leaders upon leaders that have continued this for several years to come, okay? And I just want you to take a minute to read this quote here because this is part of what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, this is from Facing History, but it's a quote from um, Suzanne Goldsmith. And I want you to think of just a, a phrase or something that you could pull out of there that resonates with you. Okay, we good? All right. What do we think? Anyone? This is the part where I call on myself. <sighs> I think for, for many students and the students that I've taught over the years, um, in that quote that it talks about being part of something bigger than oneself. Um, and also for kids, giving them the opportunity um, to be student leaders, giving them the opportunity to engage with 
community members. Like I say to the kids, like they love it when, when uh, the mayor, town council, love it when students come, right? And ask them to participate in something. They think it's, it's wonderful, right? We send the students to the administration because it's harder to say no to kids than it is to adults. Um, and, and one of the things that I think for kids, and you know, we've had students now who have graduated eight, 10 years ago, it has impacted the choices that they have made. You know, some of them have become human rights lawyers as a, a result of their work, right? Some of them have become teachers, right? So these ideas, um, you know, stay with them perhaps longer than we think. All right, so I want us to talk a little bit more. I'm tired of hearing myself talking. So I'm gonna give you an example here, um, building community, right? So our essential questions, how do we recognize similarities? amongst people and how do we make a positive change in our school community and how do we work together to build a unified school community that affords all people membership okay um, and some of the things that i do in the beginning of the year uh, is to create an inclusive classroom and you can see there that unity is in capital letters okay because that is the focus of the class like i say to the kids there are more things that unite us than divide us, okay? Ideas like a bio poem, making a list of things that kids have in common, identity charts, uh, looking at the power of people's names, establishing a class contract. Um, do you know what the four corners activity is? Has anybody ever done that in their class before? All right, so you have a, like a big poster or a big paper and you have like disease, disability, uh, race, ethnicity, um, gender, sexuality, and religion. And you have the kids, you can even have them all do it with like a black marker. It doesn't have to be the same color, but you have them write down there everything that relates to them, right? So I might write my ethnicity as, you know, Polish, German, and Irish, right? And then Patrice follows, and then Patrice will check, well, if she's German or Irish, you just put a tally mark next to it. Somebody then goes over and writes for disease, cancer, and other people would put a tally mark through it, right? So you're not writing your name, but as the class goes around and you visually look at this at the end, you can see that although everybody in the class is different, there's a lot of similarities um, that people have and maybe situations that people face um, to help build community. Okay, so what I'd like to do is hear from some of you because you probably have great ideas of what you do in your classroom um, to build a sense of community. Somebody put something in the chat. Anybody? Okay. Do you know what the bio poem is? Like, do you want to talk more about this or should I move on to something else? Or are we good on class building a classroom? Yes? I, I'd like you to, um, I don't know what a bio poem is. I'd like to hear more about that. Okay. Um, so a bio poem, there's actually a, a resource on facing history, right? There's a couple things, ways you can do it is the bio poem is essentially a poem uh, about themselves. So they state their name and they have a brainstorming activity, right? Uh, three accomplishments that I have. Um, three things that I'm, I'm afraid of, three things that are part of my hope or aspiration, um, people that are important to me in my life. Um, and then the kids will go through and essentially write a poem. So for me, it's the activity that will, my kids will do on Thursday on the first day of school. It's a way to get to um, know the kids. And also what I do is I hold on to them 
Uh, and so we have a unit on the Renaissance. We talk about, you know, talented people and what a Renaissance person is. And then what I'll do is go back and read through without saying their names, like each of the um, students' accomplishments that way. So they get to hear it as a, they get to hear it as a group. Right, the disability, the race, I'll do that maybe, you know, a week and a half into the school year to try to build um, more support. We talk also about names, like how you got your name, what your name means, if you would change your name. We complete, have you ever seen identity charts before? Okay, so in um, an identity chart, Uh, what you would do for the most part is put your name in the middle um, and also you would identify different groups that you are that you are part of right so it's a way for students to be able to do some self-identification right the way they might see themselves because part of part of their learning uh, is one is the content that you're teaching, but also part of the learning is going to be, you can see it right there, yes. Hold on, let me share my screen here. Um, I'll pull it up, full screen. Okay. So you can see here, this is actually, this is a good resource from Facing History, right? And you can print it out so the student will write their name in the middle, okay? And then you can see here, uh, write rectangles, words, phrases to describe what you consider to be part of your identity, right? I am a, I'm a sister, I'm a daughter, right? I am a, I'm a mother. Right, my religion is this, my ethnicity is this. Uh, I'm part of the cross country team. I'm part of the cheerleading team. I'm part of the football team, right? I'm part of the band, I'm part of dance. So what aspects make up your identity, right? And then even as you have discussion, some of the things that you can delve into further are you know, talking about even the idea of the iceberg like that there is a part of us that we present to the world. And there's a part of us that is, you know, personal and private that is, you know, personal to us, right? Some things that we don't show, correct? Right, and so these ways, like one, I get to know my students, right? I also will complete an identity chart about myself. So they're learning about me. Right, and then they're beginning to learn about each other, right? And you want to set this up. I know there's like a rush because there's so much content to cover. And I feel like on the first day of school, like I'm behind already. Um, but setting up your classroom to be a, a safe space um, and an identity affirming space is probably one of the most important things that you do, right? Because we know as teachers, Right, we try to know our students as best as we can, but we don't know everything about them, right? And we don't know what they're bringing in. We don't know what they've experienced, right? We only know what they tell us. And I say that to my kids, like I am many things, but I am not a mind reader, right? We know that, you know, kids have experienced trauma, especially over the past couple of years, they might have experienced loss, right? And all of this comes in and impacts their learning, right? And it also impacts their identity, right? You have a student in class perhaps, and, and we've had them in our school, certainly like students that are Muslim that do not want anybody to know what their religion is because they fear that they're going to be targeted in some way, right? We have kids that, um, you know, are transitioning, right? That are, you know, questioning their own identity, trying to figure out who they are, and we need to have a space that affirms who they are because that might be the safest space that they have in the school. They might not have that space at home either, right? So those are some of the things that in addition to all of the content that we address in the classroom. Are there any questions? 
We're good? Okay. So let's go back to um, All right, let's go back and just look at contracting. Are we aware of what contracting is? Do you do that in your classes at all? Okay. All right, so, um, you know, I'm a social studies teacher, so I teach US2 and I teach world history. And we have a fair amount of Socratic seminar conversation. So it could be uh, an article we read, it could be some type of historical documents and we circle up and kids are expected to develop questions like facilitate conversations. And some of these are, you know, controversial issues that we'll discuss. Some of them have many different layers to it. Um, but we have these contracting or group norms because one of the things that we want to promote is civil discourse, right? So as you can see there, listening, and the important thing is here is making comments using I statements, right? Not allowing students to make generalizations about other people, right? Because the only thing that I can talk about is what my experience is. And I cannot project my experience on my students because they all have their own unique experiences, right? Siblings, right, in the same family are going to, even though they're the same family, have different experiences. Okay, one is also like we talk a lot with the kids about intent versus impact, right? You might not have intended it to mean something one way, but the impact, uh, the way the person interpreted it was not positive, you know, and to take ownership of that and acknowledge what happened. Mary, can I ask a question? Yes. So when you, when you set up these norms in the classroom, Yes. You get pushback or do the students, does it help them navigate how to have these conversations? I mean, there's what's not, the dynamic, right? Yeah, there's, I've never had pushback with contracting. Um, and there's a, a, a resource on to like learning for justice um, about argumentation and how to have, you know, a conversation as part of civil discourse, right? With that being said, um, when I start the year in the classroom, uh, some of the things that we're going to talk about are going to be not necessarily lighter, um, but I'm not going to have a conversation on the third day of school about race, right? That's something that you need to build a sense of community if you're going to teach harder history and have those conversations. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right. So um, I think what we might do is break into um, breakout rooms for a few minutes and I'll put these questions here um, in the chat. And so I thought that maybe we could break up into smaller groups and actually have a conversation to think about, you know, what are some issues in your school and what do you want to you know, change and how do you want to help students address those issues? Because the most important thing is, as part of this, is that the students are doing the work, that you're helping to empower the students. You are not doing the work. You are the facilitator, you're the logistics coordinator, but it's like you are not doing the heavy lift. That should be the job of the students. Okay, so let me get the questions. And, uh, Mary, how many breakout rooms do you want? Um, I don't know. What do you think about four people in a in a room? Okay, so maybe three breakout rooms. Sure. Okay. All right. How'd it go? All right. Does anybody want to share? I'll share. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so it was interesting that um, our group, we are not teachers, 
um, but we are all very supportive of teachers. Um, and we are very interested in learning how to um, help bring not in our school into our community. And I've learned a lot so far. <laughs> Great. Anybody else, Robin, Julie, do you just mind like just talking briefly about some of the things that you talked about? Sure. So we talked about that some of us felt less empowered to do these things than others. Um, and then just even bringing up the topics, there was a local school board here that um, voted anti-CRT for the middle school and now they're being sued by parents, but it's a really a touchy, touchy subject. So even seeing that people seemed comfortable with it was a lot um, for me. Um, and I was excited about the toolkit and I've read uh, some of your website and talked about the anti-hate or anti-bullying maps that the schools, that you know in the schools and then having the students lead how to change the energy of those spaces. So that's what I remember. Robin? There we go. <laughs> I think that covers it. Um, we just talked about some of us maybe feeling like we might have a little more support than others too. I guess you mentioned yeah. that, but that stood out to me also. Yeah, one of the things we were talking about in our group with um, with Kelsey is just also talking about use of language. Like, you know, if you're starting a campaign or something, the way that you do it is something anti-bullying um, covers a, a broad range of in, you know issues. Or, you know, you frame it as building a culture of kindness, right? That it, it's hard to debate or say like, no, you can't build a culture of kindness, right? So. Um, those, you know, those ideas, like the way you frame what you're going to do is, you know, it's inclusive. Like your idea is, is that you want to build unity, right? You want to build an inclusive space for all kids, right? You, we want our kids, I want my kids to be kind. I want my kids to be empathetic, right? And anti-bullying, um, you know, I think at this point is not necessarily associated with critical race theory. Um, so that just invokes kindness, but it also invokes kindness to all different kinds of people. All right, any questions? All right, I'm just gonna move forward with a couple more slides as it relates to like a little bit more about ideas and, um, and how to move this out of the way. Okay, uh, I put this in, this is from our former student of mine um, that I had, there were two students that my colleague and I had who actually advocated to get the word upstander added to the dictionary. They started a change.org position and talk to our local state senator who actually uh, introduced a resolution into the New Jersey state legislature. And then finally Oxford uh, agreed to include the word in, um, in the dictionary, okay? I, I put this in here as, as Monica put, she's just uh, is finishing law school right now in environmental law, but talking about the value of community cannot be overstated. Um, I think that's something that our kids need probably more than ever because of the disconnect that they've had and the disruption that they've had in the last couple of years due to COVID, okay? For inspiration, there's so many great videos on the Not In Our Town, Not In Our School website. Uh, if you look at the original documentary that was done by Patrice, it's a short video about Not In Our Town, about taking a stand as a whole entire community. Um, there's a video on there about leaving a positive footprint of what elementary kids do. Um, there's students at my school, Watch on the Hills High School, that were filmed uh, discussing issues related to cyberbullying. Um, there's things about singing away hate. Um, so there's all different ideas um, that kids can that kids can do. It could be through film, class discussions, lunchtime activities videos, like kids are so savvy on social media, they could start their own social media campaign. Okay, um, and anything that your kids might create, uh, and you know, Kelsey, anything that your kids do that you can document through video, I know that Patrice would be thrilled to um, put it on the NIA site. 
Okay. Um, and I'm not going to show this for the sake of time, but there's a couple videos on here. Here's one. Was, uh, this was my school at Wachong Hills High School, uh, where Patrice came and filmed. This is the one about um, Billing, Montana, uh, when you had a rock th thrown through the house of a Jewish family and, and, and hate graffiti that was um, in different parts of the town, how the community came together to take a stand to say, essentially, not in our town. And we're going to that too, just for the sake of time. Um, and on, on the website, this was by another student of, of mine, Catherine Higgins, who's now a fourth grade teacher, who's an amazing teacher. Um, but I was talking about how to, we called our anti-bullying initiative a whiteout. That was a way to erase essentially your past mistakes and start over. Um, and that is on the NIOS site, but she just gives some you know, concrete advice. And she made this up when she was a high school senior. Okay, uh, you know, essentially the, the logistics, how to handle local contact with government officials, towns like the local town would make a proclamation on the day of our anti-bullying event. Some of the businesses would have white ribbons on the outside um, in support. You know, we had uh, t-shirts for the kids. Another thing we always had the kids do was to take a pledge. And this is from the town of Marshalltown, but this is on the Not In Our School website, right? So this is something that could be read over uh, the PA. You could do it that way, where kids take the pledge that way. You could print out uh, the pledge and kids could sign it. And then maybe you, you hang what the kids sign, you post it somewhere that's visual in the school in like a you know in the cafeteria in the hallway that's a constant reminder for the pledge that they took uh we sometimes just do the pledge over the announcement and then we have kids oftentimes sign a banner and those will be hung in different places in different parts of the in different parts of the school that way there's always a reminder okay all right, so what my friend and I have learned over the years, my colleague who I work with, is that you need a trusted friend to work with, all right? Because sometimes it's a lot of work to do, so it's great to tag team it, right? In your school or in your community or in your parent group, enlisting the support of the allies, right? So school community partnerships, right? working with the uh, town council, perhaps getting the support from the local police force as well, right? The bigger the network, the more support you have, um, but it also then reinforces to students that this is important, okay? Always send the kids to meet with the administration, law enforcement, town council, parent groups, and so on, because they like hearing from the kids, and this is the empowerment, and this is the learning experience for the kids, right? That they have to create the letter, that they have to email, that they have to set up the appointment, that they have to show up to the appointment, that they have to speak with adults of authority, that they have to present their case, okay? Do not take no for an answer. If somebody says no, like, you go back again and ask. Be persistent. Okay, and you really need, you know, two to three student leaders, right? Some of them might have a large friend group. Um, some of them might be the captain of the team. They don't have to be, right? But if they have a group of friends that they can inspire, that will make a huge difference. Okay, start small. Okay. Language matters, right? Especially in our politically uh, divisive society right now, okay? The way that you frame things, right? The idea of building a culture of kindness, creating a culture of unstanders, anti-bullying, right? Um, all of those things are something that are, you know, essentially innocuous and that it includes a large group of people. Okay, so support from sports teams, coaches, okay? And, you know, especially if those of you that are teachers, you know, any way that you can tie what you're doing to your state standards, 
right? New Jersey has pretty specific state standards about what you have to teach about race, about LGBTQ issues, about disability. So if it is tied to state standards and if it's tied to the curriculum that has been approved of by the Board of Education and you submit lesson plans that have been approved by your administrator, and you are pretty much covered in what you are doing, okay? Uh, number 12 there, it's like, it's important that whether it's you as the parent, you as the community leader, especially working with the kids, that you serve essentially as the facilitator and the liaison, that this is the kids doing the work, right? It's not me doing the work uh, with a group of kids. It's me, you know, helping them, giving them logistical support, giving them advice, but they are the ones doing the work, right? Because you can't cultivate leaders if you don't give them opportunity to lead. And you know what? The kids might screw up. They might make a mistake. It's okay. That is part of the learning experience. And we had that in, with an incident where a kid went and screamed at the Board of Education and like, you know, how to talk to them the next day. Like, maybe that's not the way you go about it. How could we have said this better, right? How do you build allies, right? You catch more bees with honey, okay? And the last one there is also at the end of anything you do, send thank you notes, right? So have the students hand write thank you notes, and send them to you know, anybody that has supported what you did, because that goes a long way as well. Okay, um, here's an example of one of the whiteout initiatives that we did. Um, as you can see there, we have the whiteout against bullying, speak up, stand up, stop hate. All right, and you can see there the kids that are signing it. There we have the cheerleaders signing it. Uh, we usually have the whiteout uh, at the time of a football game. Um, so all of the students that would be attending the football game wear white. Our colors are, as you can see there, the lovely brown and yellow and white. So um, the football team will wear white during that time as part of our you know, unity. It also might be during the football game that we have the pledge uh, that will be read at halftime uh, for our student body, okay? But this, the banner, I think is great for a lot of things that you do because it gives you uh, a great visual within the school or perhaps somewhere if it's going to be in the community. And you can see there, uh, we have t-shirts as well. We've had different uh, T-shirts over the course of years, but that one is stand up, speak up, stop hate. But that is pretty much the, you know, mantra that we use. Um, Pre-COVID, we used to have groups of high school kids that would go down to the elementary school and the middle school and do a lesson on bullying. So by the time we have kids that get to the high school, they know I can say stand up, they know speak up, stop hate. So this is something that is you know, embedded in our district K through 12. Um, for some of you that are teachers, um, that Facing History has a section that's called Choosing to Participate. Um, and that might be a way to, to spark just conversation or discussion about things that individuals have done uh, as part of being upstanders, right? One example is, uh, a man that was once part of the KKK gets partnered with an African-American woman who they're both on the board of education uh, to work together to have to solve a, a problem in North Carolina. Another one is the young woman that starts that organization, the microfinance organization, Kiva. There's one in there about my former students, Monica Mahal and, and Sarah Decker that had the word upstander added to the dictionary. Um, but it is, it talks about the ways that, you know, kids or individuals, you know, stood up and tried to, as you can see there, build a more just and compassionate world. Okay, here's another uh, event that we had in our school in 2019. Uh, after, you know, I got a text message on a Saturday night at 1130, like, did you hear what happened? 
um, and there was an off-campus uh, Halloween party where somebody appeared in blackface, um, and that was Snapchatted out and everywhere that it made, you know, the local New York news. So, um, you know, Monday morning, there were a group of kids in my room and they, you know, wanted to take some kind of action. And there were probably 30 kids that were pretty much dedicated to putting an event together. Uh, we had a walk around the track. We had a speaker come. We invited members of the community um, to take action, essentially to say that this is not, you know, who we are. And it, and it made for very interesting conversations in the classroom because you think about identity, uh, especially for kids in the school that, you know, now we were known as the KKK school, you know, so kids were like, you know, when I went to the mall, people, you know, I couldn't, I didn't want to wear my varsity jacket because now we're known as the KKK school, right? And how the actions of three or four, you know, essentially, made an assumption about the rest of the school and how do we unpack that and how do we wrestle with that and how do kids were at the party you know manage you know talk about what they did or talk about what they didn't do because some kids said something hey you shouldn't be doing that but other kids you know didn't say anything because they didn't know what to say right but i tell you right now in our district everybody knows that what blackface is and hopefully that will never happen again. But those are some of the, you know, when those things happen, those are some of the, you know, teachable moments that come for students. All right, are there any other questions? I have a quick question. Yes, ask. I don't know how to ask this correctly, so I'm going to kind of talk around it to get the gist of it. So just ask the 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 whiteout. Yes. Is it I, I understand the intent of the whiteout. But might there be a different color that can be chosen? It could be any color that can be chosen. OK, we we eventually we wanted to we were going to have all the kids wear black at one point just because they like wearing black. but. Uh, we had a principal at the time, because um, our school colors are yellow and gold, right? I'm sorry, brown and yellow, which are terrible colors. Um, and we were kind of moving toward black. And he had gone to the school and was very much a traditionalist, that there was like no black allowed in anything for years. So he picked the color, right? But if your school colors are, you know, blue or green you know have them have them wear that right when we first got the idea i think patrice it was from marshalltown i think they were orange right so you know do whatever works for you all right but kelsey if you have any questions or anybody else if you you know need help you know feel free to reach out and i'll help you any way i can thank you this was very very helpful great right. anybody else Mary, are you going to share the slides with us? Um, sure, I can do that. Also, um, if you haven't look, been looking at the chat, there are a lot of resources in the chat as well. Thank you for all the great work that you do. Keep it up. There's a lot of people cheering for you.